Welcome to the Onco PT Podcast, where you'll learn from oncology experts, practitioners, and patients to help you on your journey to become a confident and competent Onco PT. Here's your host, Elise Contu. Hey, Onco PT, and welcome to this episode of the Onco PT Podcast. Now, last time we did an interview with this person, I actually had her inside my house. Since then, I have unfortunately changed my podcast setup. So we are in our separate homes this evening, but I'm so excited to welcome back Dr. Tori Crook to the Onco PT Podcast. It has been so fun watching this local physical therapist and now very dear friend of mine blossom into the amazing Onco Onco PT that she is today. We are going to talk all about it. Dr. Tori Crook, will you please reintroduce yourself to my audience? Hi, <laughs> happy to be back. Um, always a good time on the Onco PT podcast. Um, still weird hearing my name as Dr. Tori Crook, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so I'm a physical therapist. I recently got my specialization in oncology. Woo, it still feels so surreal. Um, I work in acute care at a level one trauma hospital. It's a massive hospital. Um, and I have annoyed management to the point where they let me stay on the oncology floor. And so it's everything I dreamed of. <laughs> um, we have very wide range of cases from like very intense, like acute care work on bed mobility to mm. it's almost more like an outpatient session, but they're just stuck here for chemo for a month. So it's a lot of variety, which keeps it pretty fun. Yeah. That is really cool. Now, if you had to give your elevator pitch, you're like 32nd, how did you get into PT? And then how did you find your way into cancer rehab specifically? Okay. 30 seconds. Real quick. I, guess. I took a personality <laughs> test in college. It said kinesiology. I said, sure. Why not? I took anatomy <laughs> and I was like, that's fun. I like studying this. I'll run with it. Did shadowing. I was like, this is a fun job. Y'all get to play all day. This is awesome. And then in PT school, um, I was between a lot of different things I wanted to like specialize in. Honestly, just kind of prayed about it. And when it came across oncology, I was like, no, I was like, that's interesting. That's too hard though. That's way too much. And God was like, do that one. And I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> but it was following a lot of like family stuff and friend things. Um, just I kind of opened my eyes. I was like, oh my gosh, cancer is like everywhere, like specifically in my life. Um, and there's something I can do about it potentially in my career, like for other people. So um, and just kind of snowballed into this passion and um, just something I'm really excited about to kind of get to play a role in, even if it's like big or small. Um, it's just such an honor getting to walk with our patients like in this very difficult journey and kind of hopefully just get to empower them and give them more confidence and um, just whatever we can do to help them. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, how long have you been practicing, Tori? Three years. Wait, yeah, three years. January twenty twenty one. The three and a half. Yeah, right. Three and a half. Yeah, like three and a half years now. Very cool. Yeah. So, at what point did you decide you wanted to then specialize in oncology? I think a, like half a year before graduation, um, in PT school really? actually. Yeah, because I because when I was like praying on like oh what what do I want to do? I was already thinking like, what do I want to specialize in? And our school is real big on talking about like board specialization and stuff like that. And a lot of our professors mm -hmm. had one in like neuro or geriatrics or ortho. So that was kind mm -hmm. of almost like the standard at that time, just because that's what we were surrounded by. Yeah. Um, and so in 2019 was the first year for the oncology specialty. And 2020 was whenever I'd kind of like learn more about the um oncology being an option and i was like okay mm -hmm. so uh that's kind of when the seed was planted and it just got stronger and stronger especially as like i learned it was really hard and then people told me like oh maybe you can't do it then i was like okay i'm gonna do it then like tell me i can't <laughs> i'm doing it twice like i don't i'm just stubborn <laughs> That sounds like me. I th yeah. I think that's I why we bonded so much. <laughs> yeah. What did you know about oncology specialization specifically before you started the process? Not much. Yeah, honestly, not much at all. I was very confused. <laughs> so I was like, this sounds so cool. And it was, it was I, the podcast actually helped a lot 
um, learning like, okay, what even is on CoPT? Like, I want to work in this mm -hmm. field. It sounds so cool, but like, what does it even mean? Um, so like podcasts, things on like social media, just kind of learning like, okay, what are the groundworks? What are like examples of where this type of therapy is different than what you'd like normally do? Um, yeah. So I think that was kind of the first step. And then learning more about specialization specifically, it was definitely like meeting therapists that had their specialization or were currently working towards it and kind of hearing their different takes on how they approach their practice and like the process of going through. So I think just a lot of social media kind of stuff, but then also like networking was big. Yeah. What did you know about the, like the actual ABPTS oncology application and then kind of preparation process for the exam? Because I think a lot of listeners have this idea of like, I want to specialize. I want to be really entrenched in oncology and know all there is about oncology. But then when we kind of transition or like, you know, start really getting into the actual process, like the logistics of the ABPTS oncology process, I think a lot of people get kind of discouraged or confused and then don't pursue it. So what did you know about that, the, the, the process before you started that? I knew to call you. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I was like, I'm not good at like paperwork things and navigating websites. That's not me. I get very confused and overwhelmed. I'm just like, let's close it and we'll worry about it later. Um, yeah. So yeah, honestly, knowing that there is a resource through um, your whole like platform with like the Onco PT bootcamp and like the case study workshop, all of that. I was like, I need to do that because <laughs> I just try to do it on my own. I just get really confused. So the whole like, um, website and like going in and like creating like your account and the application and all that like it, it got confusing for sure um so it was great like kind of having guidance through you and then talking to other people had already taken it um but yeah i would say the logistic i'm just not a big logistics person and that was very confusing to get started for sure um mm -hmm. and if you feel that way that's that's fine like you'll get there you'll just call elise like you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> For yeah. real though, like that was one of the things I almost didn't make it to the point of like preparing for the exam because that was the same for me. Like the application process felt really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It, Looking back on it, it is okay. Like once yeah. you figure out what you're doing, it wasn't that bad. But just the process of, like you said, kind of getting logged into the system, mm -hmm. doing the application. Honestly, the case report was very, very challenging for me. Yeah. <laughs> and so once you get past that, it's like, oh, okay. You know, that's where you kind of get into the, you know, the reviewing about the oncology things, the treatments, the side effects, what we do for this patient population. I was like, oh, I got that. I can, mm -hmm. I can learn about that. But the paperwork side of things, yeah. I'm with you, Tori. It was I think even Sorry. logging the hours was like, wait, what? Because I was going way too in depth and way too like detailed and stressing myself out with counting all my hours. Like, so I'd have my mm -hmm. schedule for the day and I'd circle all the patients that were oncology related. And then like the time yeah. and be like, okay, I got three hours of oncology today and like add it. And I was like, that was crazy. So really it's more <laughs> of like, like a percentage and so mm -hmm. by the time I was actually due to like submit my hours, I had been moved primarily on oncology floors. So it was like 90% mm -hmm. of my case load was oncology. So nice. um, you got to make sure you get your hours, but it's not like on right. this day, I did exactly 20 minutes. Like it's not that specific. Like don't lie, obviously, but I definitely stressed my, myself out with that for a good while. <laughs> so, I did yeah. the same thing. Um, I had the advantage and we've talked about this. I was at one mm -hmm. institution the entire time, whereas because I know you, because we're friends outside of the podcast, you actually have been at two mm -hmm. different places during the time that you were amassing your hours. Can you actually, I know this isn't a question I prepped you for, but can you talk about what that process looked like having multiple jobs mm -hmm. where you were getting those oncology hours for the application process? Um, as far as like my first job by that time, like whenever I was calculating the hours and stuff, I had already done that more on like an average. So based on like, okay, so this many patients a day and like blah, blah, blah. 
and they were all mm-hmm. oncology at that point. So that made that easier. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then it was reaching out to my old manager to sign off to be like, hey, that's accurate, approved and all that. And that was scary because I was like, is this still your email? Like, I don't know. Um, so that was kind of like nerve wracking, but I was like, it, it was fine. He signed it. It was good. Uh, no problems. And then I overly stressed myself out with my current job in acute care tracking the hours. And then when I went to go talk mm-hmm. to my supervisor and I'm like, I don't know if this is completely accurate. She had just done her wound care one. She goes, girl, just round. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, just don't tell me it's like 5,000 hours and you for like, whatever. And I was like, oh, so it wasn't as stressful <laughs> as I thought. And I think we might've undershot it a little bit, but I was well over the, how many is it? Two or 3,000? It's t- last I checked, it was 2000. 2000. Yeah. So it's a little over that. Um, nice. A good chunk, I guess. But yeah. Nice. So yeah. Talk, talk to someone who's done it and they'll talk you <laughs> off the ledge and it'll be a little easier because <laughs> I was, I was freaking out for a minute, but yeah. Yeah. So at this point you've now committed to the process. You are, you know, going through the application, you're writing your case report, I offer, and this is something that we're talking a lot about today, I offer my signature course, which is called Oncology Specialist Bootcamp, which helps physical therapists prepare for the exam and to really step in to their role as a sought after specialist in cancer rehab in their area. At what point did you decide and say, I am going to enroll in Oncology Specialist Bootcamp? Probably after like the fifth day of staring at my computer screen and nothing had been written. But yeah, <laughs> and I was yeah. Like, oh no! <laughs> I'd like start here and I'd start there. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going. I know what I want to write about. I have all these notes from like the case and like research, but I'm like, I don't. I'm stuck and I don't know where to go. And so then, because I was like, I can do no math, and I was like, I can't. So I signed up for the course. Um, and it's just so helpful because it breaks it down into like all the sections you've got to do and it makes it way less like stressful and overwhelming. So instead of this giant paper, it's like, just write this one sentence. That's the only thing do in that part. Okay. Now make a table. Like it's just so much easier to like put it together that way instead of just staring at it and be like, I have to do this and I have to do that and I have to do this and that. And then I mm-hmm. did nothing. Cause it's scary. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. Send it, send, do the course. It's fine. It's, <laughs> it's so helpful. <laughs> One of the things that I really struggled with when I was studying, and this is obviously before I created the course, which is partially what informed the course mm-hmm. is I went really ham, like way too in depth on kind of the the cancer side of things. And what I mean by that is like the diagnosis. And I really didn't spend a lot of time until honestly the last two months before my exam on the physical therapy side of things. Mm -hmm. So I spent so much time, you know, focusing on like, these are all the different subtypes of breast cancer. And these are the statistics of how many people are. And it like, there is nothing in the recommendations that says you should know this, but that's just where my brain went. Cause I was mm-hmm. like, I need to know everything there is to know about cancer. And then also I'll figure out the physical therapy things, which was totally <laughs> backwards. That's also why I made oncology specialist boot camp because I made a lot of mistakes along the way. What was something or some things that you found helpful about oncology specialist boot camp in guiding your studying for the exam? Um, I think to your point of what you just said, one of the first like lecture videos says, y'all, y'all quoted it and y'all were like, you're not an oncologist, you're an oncology PT. <laughs> like quit reading that about the specific familiar, genome yeah. <laughs> that does this percent and then da, da, da. like, that's not your call. It's not your job. It's interesting. And I think, and it's complicated. It's like, whoa, fascinating. And you can run down a rabbit hole so easily, but it's like rain it in. Like, you don't have to know that. That's great like don't mm-hmm. get overwhelmed with like the tiny details so i know that was in one of the very first videos and i was like mm-hmm. <laughs> noted so when i was like mm-hmm. going through stubble field and i was like i don't understand half these words it's like i don't have to and that was just oh, like that's a good a breath point. of fresh air and i was like okay good i can kind of again simplify it because what you do need to know is still complicated and it's still like yeah. advanced and all the stuff and whatever but there's so much more that you don't have to know it's interesting it's fun but you don't gotta stress yourself mm-hmm. out about it um, mm-hmm. so I think that was super helpful to know, like from the get go. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Now you and I were talking off air right before we started. And, you know, one of the things that you and I have had many conversations about is like, you know, oncology specialist boot camp is it really kind of ties together a lot of the different resources that are used. And one of the resources that is recommended by, you know, APTA oncology to study for the exam is the stubble field text. It's mm -hmm. called cancer rehab. Um, I'm looking at it actually on my floor right I'm now. Right, right, down here. Practice, right? <laughs> it's right here. And, and it's, you know, it's a good textbook, but I think it's really written by a physiatrist for physiatrists. And I think that other professions can get information out of that. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I, I saw is that I couldn't just read that textbook co like cover to cover and expect mm -hmm. to be prepared for the exam. And you had a method for taking notes and like calling, you know, really important parts out that I, I wish I had known about. Um, and I would really love if you could talk about now, what was that? How did you use it? Like, tell me all the things. So I'm very, Okay, wait, first off, I forgot to tell you this before, but I highly oh, yeah. recommend everyone learn your learning style first. So in college, one of my first anatomy classes, the professor is like, do not come ask me a question if you haven't taken this test already. So it's called the VARC. So it's like a visual auditory reading and kinesthetic. So you take this quiz and it's like more of a personality quiz, but it tells you how you learn the best. So are you more of a visual learner? Do you, are you more auditory? Like, is it kind of set you got to pick it up and throw it around or do you just need to talk it out? Um, so usually you score really high in like two areas. So those are kind of the mm -hmm. two ways you should probably study stuff to retain it better. Mine were like literally tied even all the way across. And I was like, oh. Holy cow. And she's like, yeah, you got to do everything to retain anything. And I was like, all right. Cool. So, cool. <laughs> yeah. But um, knowing that, so I know I have to like, like videos help. It's kind of the auditory visual side, like talking it out helps. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be color coordinated in my head. Like literally every muscle has a different color um, in my head from PT school. It's just how it is. That's how it I remember works. it. Like your gas yeah. are green and your pecs are red. I don't know. But it's just how it is. But that's how I remember all the stuff. So knowing that it's like, okay, I need to color coordinate my chemos. I need to color coordinate all these different things. Um, but knowing how I learn the best and how I retain it the best was super helpful. And so especially mm -hmm. if you've been out of school for a minute, um, just kind of learning your learning style was huge. Because knowing that through like college and then grad school, I knew, okay, got to go back to that basic how my brain works and go from there. Um, yeah. so knowing that, especially the kinesthetic side, I need, I like love holding things and touching like the topic. So usually I'd write everything out like on flashcards. And so mm -hmm. like this topic's over here and then I could physically move it and be like, oh, that's how this relates to that. I work 40 hours a week. I don't have time for that. So I was like, what am I going to do? But I need yeah. it handwritten. I can't just type or just read. Um, so I've got this app. It's called Good Notes. I highly recommend it. It was like $5 and that's it. Um, but basically you can upload like whatever PDF files to it and then just write all over them. So you can do whatever color you can, um, like take a picture from Google, like of a diagram or whatever you want and literally paste it on that PDF. So it's like right oh there. God. There's so there's yes. a lot of really cool ways to make it really pretty, but it's also <laughs> really easy just to get whatever information you want, like there. So I have a mm -hmm. whole folder in my good new good notes for the oncology boot camp. Um, and then like every lecture has that PowerPoint. And so I would go back and like update things as I was learning. So like our mm -hmm. chemotherapy PowerPoint, cool, great, went through that. But then as I went through all the other ones, if it hit on another chemo and that seemed really important or like a key thing to remember, I'd go back to the initial PowerPoint and like add it in. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like a continual growth of that topic, but like located in one oh. place. And mm -hmm. then since it was mm -hmm. on an app, um, I did most of it on my iPad so I could like write it out and all the stuff. Um, but then I could also get it on my phone. So if I was at work and I was like, oh, I don't remember what this or that was, I just open up my good notes, pull up that thing. And then it's right there. So it's always with you instead of having to be like, oh, I took notes in like the textbook on page 406 and I don't have it with me. It's like, ah, mm -hmm. oh no. But now it's like kind of always with you. Um, it's a lot easier to like edit and add on to 
Um, so that helped a lot. And then even with like the stubble field book, I never really opened the actual textbook. Um, mm-hmm. the textbook version I brought, I bought had the PDF with it. So Same. I would just upload each chapter, um, that I was reading through into good notes, take all my notes through there. They're color coordinated. It's nice and pretty. I'm importing like extra pictures in there to like figure out what's what. And then same thing. I can just kind of take it with me wherever I go. Cause it's on my phone yeah. or it's on my iPad. Um, so that was super helpful because just kind of typing stuff out on the computer wasn't going to work. So I can like actually write it out. Um, there's a way you can add audio clips on your good notes too. I didn't do that because oh I don't really hear myself talk that much, <laughs> but, um, yeah. So the tech side on like the good notes was game changer, just a way to keep everything in one spot, but expanded, but consolidated. And so crazy helpful. Um, the other tech savvy thing, so is Circle, right? Is what the app we're on yep. for the course. So mm-hmm. download the app. I don't know why I was like, oh, I can only do it on my computer. And then I, when I finally got the app, I was like, wait a second, can I watch <laughs> these videos just on my phone? So when yeah. I walk my dog in the morning, I would just put it on. And so I'm not like intensely studying, but it's like mm-hmm. active listening while I'm walking like to the video. So oh it's just God, repeated exposure to like yes. all the content and it's not like overwhelming or burning myself out as much. It's just like, let's just listen. And like here and there, you're like, girl, call this, call that. Or at least whenever you go and sit and study it for real, it's familiar. Um, so that was big yeah. too. And then like, just playing like oncology YouTube videos when I was cleaning my kitchen, the same thing. I'm not actively like, um, learning, but I'm hearing in the background, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And so then when I go back and like study, study, it's like kind of already there. Um, Mm -hmm. so that was helpful. There was another app called Speechify. So that one, same thing, you can upload, um, PDFs and it'll read it out to you. It also has like an AI component. So it'll summarize the whole article for you. So if you look at the study list for the exam, it's just five jillion articles. Overwhelming. It's insane. Like don't Mm -hmm. go read every single article for a bit like that. You can't, you wouldn't learn anything from it and you'd learn some stuff, but not all the stuff you need to know and how to apply and all that. But um, some of the big articles, like the Maltzer article and stuff like that, I would just put it on (laughs) Speakify and then just have it play and just read it to me while I did things. And the same thing, it's just like continual like exposure and I'm not having to actively sit down and just focus. I can do whatever I need to do, but I'm hearing it. And then you can also pick the voice. And so Snoop Dogg is one of the voices. (laughs) So Stop. Snoop Dogg read a oh lot of God. apology articles to me, and it was, like, fantastic. Like, I thought it helped a lot. <laughs> it's a good app. Yeah, all the apps. Good notes, speech by, circle, do them all. That's, yeah. first of all, I can't believe I haven't heard of these apps before. Like, you yeah. introduced me to good notes literally before this, and I'm learning about Speechify right now in the interview. I will be linking to all of these in the show yeah. notes, but I want to pull out. I So... Again, I feel like I studied in the dark ages compared to you, Tori, because you were like in the year 3000. But I want to back up what Tori said about, so my textbook, my copy of Cancer Rehab by Stubblefield, same thing. I have the PDF and I would use that to search for topics, which I found so useful because again, like, yes, there's, there's totally an index in the back of the book, but man, it like, I am such a whiz when it comes to control F, like highly recommend, but being able to layer that within. And that's something that I really was impressed by your studying methods is you would take the slideshows that we covered in oncology specialist bootcamp, import them into Goodreads and then layer on tidbits from stubble field, right to like, Mm -hmm. and again, you're hitting all of these, like you have such wisdom to recognize your own learning methods and like what works best for you. Like I've, again, I feel like I studied in the dark ages compared to where you're at, Tori. It's incredible. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's also just knowing my brain, like if I don't do all those steps, I'm not going to retain anything. Mm -hmm. I just won't. Yeah. And so so I'd have to do all the tiny little things and I just like com- repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And then it sticks. So, right. Yeah. Right. And honestly, I don't think I had like a very good, like routine or method down for all of it up until like 
two months before the exam. And I was like, why didn't Mm -hmm. I know this sooner? So start early, even if you're just dabbling, just, it doesn't have to be like dabbling and like, like remembering everything, but at least just dabbling in like, how do I study? Like, how is this going to work? Like, is there an app for that? Like there probably is and you should download it because I learned that way too late with the circle one for sure. Um, So just start (laughs) early, but like, don't get overwhelmed. Just kind of, even if just be like, I'm learning how I learn and I'll take some of the pressure off to start. And then when you know how you learn, then it makes the actual studying the content intensely less stressful because you know what you're doing and it sticks better. So yeah. Wish I would have done that sooner, but it's okay. (laughs) So question on then going to that point, when did you start studying to take your exam? So you took your exam earlier this year, what, like February March. of 20 or March of no, 20. I took it like the day before the last day you could. Cause oh my God. <laughs> that's just okay. my personality. I was so, like, we're doing last minute. <laughs> last minute, save it, you know, save it for your, when the wisest and you have the most information in your brain. When did you start preparing for the exam? Um, when the case study was due, I want to say that definitely started the process. So like writing through the Mm -hmm. case study and like pulling all those articles and looking through the list of like, what's recommended to read and seeing like, okay, Mm -hmm. does that apply to my case study? What can I pull in and like refer to? I think that was kind of the very beginning stages. Honestly, I was so stressed out of the case study because I, again, waited too late (laughs) to like do everything where it wasn't crazy stressful. Um, I was a little like just frazzled after that. So I don't think I started studying, studying until after I heard back, like, okay, cool. Your case studies approved. You can sit for the exam. And then even then, I think I had a week of like, what did I just do? Like, (laughs) what? And then I kind of started rolling into it. So I guess November, December. Okay. Like intense, like actually like studying, like because with work and everything else, like you're getting exposed to it. You're learning things, but study, study. Good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I think that's a really good perspective on, you know, this doesn't have to be, and it also shouldn't be a year long process. Like don't start in April mm-hmm. to take the exam in March of the next year. I think that's far too long. I don't yeah. think it's even useful at that point. Cause I, I love what you said, Tori, about if you're on the job and you're working with oncology patients, like you're practicing, you're mm-hmm. putting into practice what you have been learning and what you'll continue learning. And I think that's also a really important point of, you know, you might go over something in a study session, for example, and it's not until you've actually had an interaction with the patient and then you're reflecting on it saying, oh, (laughs) that's what that means. Or that was helpful in this case here. So again, you don't, you don't have to make this your full-time job of studying when you already have, because again, like Tori's mentioned, Tori works full-time. Tori also has a engaging and active social life where she hangs out with friends and you go to workout classes and do all these things. Like you were not a hermit for a whole year leading up to this exam, were you? No. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think like that was again, knowing myself. And so I knew like if Mm -hmm. I just exclude myself from like everything and only study and I'm going to get burnt out so fast. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be like more stressed out than if I just try and delegate my time better. Um, so like there were times where I was like, Oh, this is a really fun thing with my friends. I'm going like, I don't want to miss that memory or I don't want to miss that thing. But that means this other day when we're going to brunch, it's just kind of random. I got, I got to dip out. Like, you know, so you have to kind of prioritize a bit different. Um, but also like live your life, you know, like I went on a trip to Montana in January before the exam to go see a friend and we like went skiing and all this stuff. Great, cool, fun. Um, should I have studied more? Maybe, I don't know. But at the same time, it's like, when am I going to go to Montana and go skiing? It's so cheap. Like, I don't know. Exactly. So you gotta like just prioritize it different. Um, and I think like, the one occasion where that hit like the most of like, you know, like this is great. You guys study for it, but like you all still have to like live your life. Um, there was one evening where I had like this big study plan and all these things. I was like, okay, I've got to get all this stuff done tonight. And then found out that was actually the night, um, for a funeral for one of our patients who had recently passed. And so a lot of the nurses were going, they're like, are you going? And I was like, 
yeah okay yeah i'm going like because why are we doing this like it's not like don't get me wrong i like adding letters to the end of my name it's fun but like that's not the point it's like she was the point like getting to like help her like through your journey as best i could until we couldn't like that was the point so getting to go um to the funeral service and just kind of show the family like hey like we really care about y'all we really care about her um that meant a lot more than getting to sit and like study about it if that makes sense so it's like kind of prioritizing things and just really remembering like what's going to keep you 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 know by the end of it all you don't want to like get done with the test and look around and be like oh no like what do I do now (laughs) like it's it's a balance of it all so yeah yeah well, and again, focusing on, you know, th- at, at the end of the day, this is not about putting extra letters mm-hmm. behind your name. Yes, is that cool? Do I yes. love that? Do I love yeah. a certificate yep. as much as the next person? <laughs> yes. But like, we don't do this for the pin. Mm-hmm. We do this because it's helping us become better clinicians to show up in our own communities to help patients. And Tori and I have, I think, a very... Maybe unique, but also probably not that unique situation where we live. So again, spoiler alert, Tori and I live in Fort Worth, Texas. And Fort Worth, Texas, I think is the 13th largest city in the United States. It's actually pretty big. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there is such a lack of cancer rehab available and accessible to patients that like Tori and I, are the only oncology certified specialists that I know of in Fort Worth, Texas. And that is not okay. Like it's cool. And if we're like, Oh, we're so cool. That is not okay. Because that means that patients unfortunately are not getting the care that they need unless you, the listener show up for the patients like Tori is doing. Tori, what now that you're on the other side of it? um, First of all, what were the results of your exam? Eventually you took the exam. Like what happened? Um, I got an email and I opened it and it was like, log in. And I was like, are you kidding me? And then I forgot my login. And it took forever to log in. And I was like, forgot password. And so like five minutes later of like panicking, um, I logged in and it was like, pass. And I was like, liar. No, I didn't. And so then I went in and I read like all the score and it shows you the whole chart thing. And like that you passed. And I was like, oh, I passed. So it is crazy. Yeah, but I passed. I still don't believe it, but we're running with it. So um, we're here. You definitely passed. Like I definitely crazy. saw this certified specialist. I saw your name on a list. So I saw it's, my name it's on legit. the email and I was like, what? Exactly. And then they sent me like a, a email to like add this badge to your email sign off. And I was like, okay. <laughs> great. Oh my God. Sure. <laughs> So again, spoiler yeah. alert, Tori Ooh. passed the exam. Now that you're on this side of it, Tori, and you, you've mentioned a little bit about this, but I'd love to know more. How has preparing for the specialty certification exam affected your practice and what you do every day with your patients as an Onco PT? A lot. So I think regardless of if I like passed or not, um, even leading up to the exam, there were certain patients where I was like, oh my gosh, had I not been studying, I would have completely missed this Um, or not gone about it as safely as I should have. A good one patient had multiple myeloma. He had a really gnarly like uh, metastasis like in his hip and just the way Mm -hmm. he was presenting, I was like, oh, because we already knew he had spinal fractures. Um, his case was mm-hmm. very complicated, was unfunded, undocumented, how to get back to Mexico. We had to figure out all the charity stuff, like at the, it was a wow. lot. He was the coolest dude though. And he, my Spanish is not good, but he complimented it. I was like, you were very nice. Oh, um, so sweet. He, he was so nice. Um, but yeah, so anyways, the way he was presenting after reviewing like the morales criteria and like really reading through all that stuff, I was like, you are such a high risk for like pathological fracture. So like we yeah. need to not work on just walking because that's acute care, just walk them and blah, blah, blah. it's like, no, 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 like let's be real specific on what we're doing here. And so he couldn't mm-hmm. tolerate standing super great for a long time. So I was like, let's not do that then. So we worked mm-hmm. a lot primarily on um, wheelchair transfers, kind of trained and changing up how we did that too. So he could tolerate getting into a car, worked on different positioning in the bed because he'd have to tolerate yeah. being in a car for a long time. Um, right. he had like a TLSO and all that, like 
for support. We talked about like pressure points, like all that. And then just reiterating over and over again to the family, I was like, it is not important that you walk a far distance right now. I was like, if that's crazy painful, mm-hmm. I was like, you need to sit down. Um, yeah. And then using the wheelchair for cardio at that point. So like we're seated walking, you look kind of silly, but I call it like a hospital bike because we don't have bikes, but it's like, we're taking pressure off where that med is and you're still moving. And then even them just having to push themselves with their arms, they get winded pretty quick. Like it's a workout. Absolutely. Um, so kind of just changing everything I would have done versus like, Oh, let's just make him walk. And like, right. Are you wrong doing that? No, but also, yeah. And so, um, just kind of seeing how like my, like mindset changed on like certain cases and like just these key things I might have missed or like overlooked had I not been studying. Um, mm-hmm. it's like even we have um, some APML cases. And so after reading in stubble field mm-hmm. specifically about like how arsenic, arsenic affects like the pulmonary system and all that. I was mm-hmm. like, holy crap, we better condition these patients like crazy. So I have one patient right now yeah. and he's 27 and he's fine. Like acute care therapy wise, like he's walking up and down in the hallways all by himself, like no problem. Um, but when we first started working, his heart rate was like 140 after walking like 50 feet. And I was like, that's not good. Like you're on our sink. What are we going to do? So um, we've been like progressing him and stuff. And so now we're to where he can walk all day and he's fine. Like he's saying like 120s, which is still high, but I'm like, okay, like we're monitoring this well. Like you're tolerating this activity way better than you were before. So yeah. now we're working on stairs. Like he doesn't have to climb multiple flights yeah. of stairs to get in his house. And, eh. But he's 27. He should be able to go up and down a flight of stairs without wondering his heart's going to explode. So that's Definitely. like the new thing we're doing to kind of like push him and advance him and all that. Um Versus like, had I never studied for any of this stuff, I would have completely overlooked the specific chemo he was on. I would have been like, oh, like we're acute care. Like you're great. You're good. You're safe to go home without thinking like, okay, how many more cycles of chemo do you have? Like, how is this going to affect you? Like you're so young. What can we do now to try and like preserve your health the best we can? So Mm -hmm. um, certification or not, like just having that knowledge and being able to help like people just a little more specifically has been like really cool. So Absolutely. And, you know, again, I think this needs to be called to the front of listeners' minds is it's not that you would have been doing like terrible rehab, Mm -hmm. but you're doing great rehab, extremely intentional and a lot of, you know, forward thinking that I don't know. And I mean, like, heck, first of all, I'm not in acute care, so I'm not thinking about these things. I work entirely in outpatient. But you even mentioned it of, you know, it wasn't, it wouldn't necessarily be bad at the end of the world, but you're taking those extra steps because you have this extensive knowledge and ability to kind of step back and look at the situation with some different lenses on, you're able to contribute much more effectively to not just the here and now of what that patient needs, but also looking bigger picture Mm long-term, you know, what happens when they leave the hospital or even as they're going to stay in the hospital because you know that they are getting, you know, X number of additional treatments as part of their treatment regimen, whatever. Like that is something absolutely, you know, and I think as your friend and as your colleague, I think you would have gotten there eventually, Mm -hmm. but how many years would it have taken to get to that point? You know, I don't, I don't know the answer yeah. to that, but I do think you Long have time. really shrunk that time from a starting to where you are now able mm-hmm. to really have that insight and perspective to elevate the level of care you're providing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, like just kind of thinking, I was talking to one of my friends about, it, I was like, thinking of the patients I had as a new grad, I was like, I feel bad for them because I was like, did I know? <laughs> was doing I don't know same and then even my patients from last year I was like shoot what did I miss but you know you do the best you can you show up the best you can and I think just studying just studying in general for the exam is going to help you show up way better than you are now like no matter where you're at it's just going to help you Um, it's not going to hurt you maybe your ego a little bit if you don't pass but that's not the point it's to help people um and like I know residencies they kind of they have a better statistic it's like if you do a residency, it's supposed to like advance your clinical knowledge by like two or three years. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's what they usually say when you do that. Um, right. And so after I passed the exam, my mom called. She's like, so is this like the equivalent of you doing a residency on your own? And I was like, woman, what? I was like, I didn't think of that. Because <laughs> you can either do a residency to qualify to sit for the exam right. or you calculate all 20 like every minute you see a patient and then you can qualify to sit for the exam for hours. <laughs> like I did. Um, and so yep. the end goal though, is like you're board certified. And I was like, that's crazy. And so if residency is supposed to advance you that many years in your career and the end goal is to get you your certification, like just getting your certification, right. obviously like you're advancing yourself by doing that work and putting the time in. So yeah, when my mom said that, I was like, Phew. like what? That's crazy. <laughs> Smart lady, so. <laughs> well, I mean, you've got it from somewhere. Like, yeah, I guess come on, so. girl, give <laughs> yourself give yourself some credit here. Like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would you tell somebody who's considering sitting for their specialty certification and is thinking about enrolling in oncology specialist boot camp? You should have done it yesterday. Yeah. Like, don't wait, just do it. It's so helpful. Cause I mean, when I was trying to like figure out how I'm going to study and I was downloading all 5 million articles, I was like, I can't read this. I can't, I was like, it's not going to stick. It doesn't make sense. Um, and there's not another study course for this exam out there. Um, and I mean, multiple yeah. people have taken this course and like passed, I don't think there's a bad review on it. And if there is, they're probably crazy. Um, but I mean, it, cause it was so helpful. I mean, you got the PowerPoint, you got the videos, you have you to reach out to. There's like the online community. You can like go in and like ask questions. There's the mm-hmm. office hours, there's specialist talks, like in the different like niches. So like pediatrics or like acute care, like things like you probably won't see any day in your practice. You get a specialist mm-hmm. that comes in and talks about it specifically. Um, so, I mean, there's just like a wealth of knowledge all in one spot and it takes, this crazy overwhelming task and like breaks it down into chunks for like, okay, I can do this. It's still hard. Don't get me wrong. You still have to put the work in, but it's like way like more tangible and like doable than just the list of articles and just hoping for the best or reading a whole textbook. Like, I don't know what to do with that. So yeah, you should have signed up yesterday, but you can sign up today. (laughs) It's not too late, right? Yeah. Yesterday was better. Today is still good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. What advice would you give to the listener who is about to start preparing for their own oncology specialty certification exam? Oh gosh, it's going to be great. It's going to be fine. Believe in yourself. Um, I think it's the big one. I think there's definitely a lot of imposter syndrome. I was like, who am I kidding thinking I'm going to sign up for this um, and pass it? Like, I'm crazy. Um, but also, like, as you're learning stuff, like, talk it out with people. So, like, talking to my coworkers and being like, hey, I read this and da da da. They're like, we have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. I was like, oh, really? And so <laughs> that actually kind of helped to just kind of be like, okay, this is different. This is specialized, mm-hmm. like, what I'm learning isn't common knowledge. Like, I'm doing okay. And then also talking to other oncology PTs and be like, okay, I learned this thing, but like, how do you, how are you applying it in your practice? Like, well, how's it really mm-hmm. going to look whenever we take this test? And it's more of like a case-based scenario. Um, so I think chatting a lot with people was very helpful um, just to kind of give yourself a reality check, but then also give yourself a pat on the back, like good yeah. balance of those two things. Yeah. Well, if you enjoyed listening to Tori talk about all the things specialization today, you are definitely going to love Tori's presentation at our upcoming Cancer Rehab Community Conference. Tori, can you tell us a little bit about your session? I'm going to talk more. (laughs) It's crazy. I love talking about this stuff. Um, So my session, I'm blanking on the official title of it. Uh, I think it's like a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift. Yep. That's what it starts with. I know that for sure. acute care oncology. Yep. Like treating beyond just return to baseline. Baseline. Beyond return to baseline function. I think I'm like picturing it in my head right now. (laughs) It's a paradigm shift, but basically just kind of changing how we approach acute care um, is kind of what I found to be the most helpful and needed, honestly, with working primarily on oncology floor. Um, yeah. cause like my example with my patient that we're, we're just doing flights of stairs to like give him some more increased cardio and like something challenging cause he's young and he's going to need this. 
that's crazy if you ask like a lot of like acute therapists it's like no 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 discharge 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 like he's safe to go home we did our job we're done and it's like that's not really the case anymore though because like yeah cool he can go home but like what are we doing to make sure he doesn't come back because just american Mm -hmm. healthcare is wild right now and so um a little spoiler alert but uh, one of the quotes i like kind of took and ran with this idea on is that the er is the new primary care you got back pain you're going to the er because it takes six months to see your pcp so if that's the case in the er and it's not typically like your actual like emergencies it was designed for then what's getting admitted probably not your typical thing that we're actually designed and built for admitting and seeing an acute care And then especially in oncology, it's like everything's changing day by day as far as like how we're going about treatments. So we're getting these patients in. So we get a lot of like leukemia admits. They're there Mm -hmm. for a month minimum. Absolutely. But yeah, dude, they walk in and they're totally fine. Like we eval discharge. Three weeks later, they're almost bed bound and they got to go home in a week. It's like, what could we have done to maybe like help prevent that or like at least lessen it or at least guide them through it and get them to where they're still mobile and safe to go home? Um, so yeah, it's just kind of changing our mindset on that because honestly, just healthcare is not the same (laughs) where we're in an old system with new problems. Yeah. So that's my talk. It's crazy. (laughs) Oh my God. I really love, and I know I didn't necessarily cue you up for this, but some of what you've talked about being how your practice has changed after specializing and seeing that come through in your upcoming presentation at the Cancer Rehab Community Conference is really exciting. Not just like as your friend, because again, like we're friends outside of this interview, (laughs) but also as like, you're my colleague in Fort Worth and you and I are kind of on other, like we're on two different sides of the coin where you're inpatient and I'm outpatient. And like, we're seeing this crossover, which is really, really cool. And we're also, because we're on both sides of oncology rehab in Fort Worth, we also see very, very clearly, what are the gaps? Where are these patients falling through the cracks? Mm -hmm. And man, girl, I am so excited. I'm like, so proud of you. I'm just like, (laughs) oh, proud auntie seeing all your progress over these years oh how can people uh find you follow you and learn more from you in addition to the cancer rehab community conference oh yeah yeah i'll be on there that's still great i'm still in shock about that um (laughs) honestly like instagram it's not like very like educational or whatever but i'm on there off and on so you know i just shoot me a message and i'll reply um because i don't check my emails well enough to be honest um but you probably transferred an email from there but yeah open to chatting about whatever <laughs> i actually had a classmate reach out to me and text me she goes i've got this patient it's actually a pretty wild case um and i was even like whoa what are you gonna do but it was so cool just getting to like kind of give her some feedback she's in the primary like sports ortho clinic um, and then another mm. classmate recently, she's like, Hey, I gave your Instagram, like a patient. Cause her husband just got diagnosed with leukemia and she's got questions. I was like, cool. So, um, maybe Love there's good. not much on my actual like profile, except like just weird, funny jokes. Um, but you can always message me and I'll be more than happy to like chat. And if I don't know the answer, we'll call Elise and it'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find the answer for you, friend. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tori, thank you so much so much for coming on the Anka PT podcast again. It is always a hoot to have you on. (laughs) Um, We'll have to do this again. Like we just have to plan a topic at this point. So again, if you loved hearing Dr. Tori Crook speak today, you are going to love her upcoming session at the Cancer Rehab Community Conference 2024. You can save your seat today at the OncoPT.com slash conference. And if you are a little more intrigued about pursuing your own oncology specialty certification. I have a free masterclass that you can sit for. um, And it's going to take you behind the scenes on not only what you need to know about the specialization process, but it also gives you some insight into my signature program that we've been talking about this entire episode, Oncology Specialist Bootcamp. You can find that free masterclass at the oncopt.com slash masterclass. I know very original. And I cannot wait to see you at the conference and in that masterclass. Until next time, this is Elise with the Onco PT. And remember, you are exactly the physical therapist that your patients with cancer need.
So let's get to work. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Onco PT podcast. If you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, leave a rating and review or support us on Patreon. 